the gist of this talk is mostly to present some few examples um, that I've encountered and also some look at what I did, uh, slides that I, uh, I was sent uh, to evaluate, um, and mostly to say what could have been done better. I invite, this is the master score, so I invite people to share their own experiences as to, as to, <laughs> let's see, there. So the uh, things to know is that the, uh, this uh, craniocervical junction is a distinct osteoligamentous uh, entity with special functional demands. And sometimes just getting an understanding of the embryology uh, may prevent errors and also some uh, avo avoid you making some radiologic interpretations that may be erroneous. Uh, the injury to this uh, area or the craniocervical junction carries a risk of blunt trauma and also cerebrovascular injury. We're all aware of that. Now, some of the embryology that we, we speak of is also finding the dividing line between what we find the cranial, cranial skull base and the uh, our cervical spine. And you can see that even with development, there's a little bit of crossover that could lead to some uh, cranial cervical anomalies um, with the occipital somites uh, starting um, and, and leading to these proatlas and also the anterior arch um, versus the uh, uh, posterior arch of C1 uh, crossing uh, with the occipital uh, condyles um, uh, forming C1, C2 um, respectively. So some of the um, indications for stabilization continue to be trauma degenerative, congenital, pathologic, atrogenic, and also inflammatory as well as infection. Um, things that we talk about when we talk about trauma would be the occipital uh, condyles being um, avulsed um, versus also the uh, skull base. As you can see, it's always pertinent and prudent to get a chaperone and, and literally uh, make sure that you're examining the patient's back you're ex fully um, to appreciate some of these skull base. You would not think uh, for a skull base uh, lesion you'd be doing a back exam, but a lot of these are. Uh, uh, cranial nerves uh, that go through um, uh, could, could also be affected with injury. So I always try to uh, look at uh, particular patients that have skull base injuries uh, to make sure that they are fully functioned because you can misdiagnose and treat a benign cervical degenerative disease if you uh, fail to uh, properly uh, examine and also identify these uh, skull base lesions for the lower cranial nerves. So with the moving further down, the atlanto uh, dislocation uh, based on uh, tree analysis, uh, uh, should I say, uh, based on uh, tree analysis classification is, uh, this describes, I think we're going backwards, yeah. Describes the displacement of the occipital condyles in relation to the uh, C1 atlas. And the uh, type one will, will refer to uh, the anterior displacement of the occipital condyles. Um, a lot of these are unstable. Uh, type two um, will be just uh, distraction versus the type three involving rotation. An example would be this uh, gentleman. This was, I think, when I was in Baltimore. Uh, uh, the, uh, he presented with uh, significant distraction injury. And one thing that I want to note is that they don't always go um, solo with just, you know, atlanto axial dislocation. You can also, also have a, a jump facet posterior element fracture. So treatment of these may involve long constructs um, since this is a really high impact mechanism of injury. Surprisingly, it was intact. There were other issues that uh, could also come with also a, a sort of a, a hematoma, um, intra, intradural hematoma that uh, we, since it was intact, we, we did not elect to treat at the time of uh, stabilization and fixation. So, and over time that sort of result by, by itself and, and really had to do with the impact of injury and performing this fusion, we, we made the, uh, idea that um, we're going to stabilize them, but we're not going to go into dural because removing that, repairing, um, and since that was benign, was going to cause more problems. So some of the conditions that uh, may affect occipital uh, cervical uh, could include just trauma, rheumatoid arthritis, and also inflammatory um, lesions. And the treatment of these have evolved over time, but it still remains a complex anatomical and biomechanical um, re region 
um, with the evolution of the treatment from semi-rigid to now we're doing only rigid fixation. This is the last uh, um, bastion of uh, uh, open surgery in terms of spine surgery, but I don't think it'll it'll last very long with the uh, ev uh, with the evolution and also the advancement of technology. The consequence of rigid fixation include the neural injuries uh, from uh, penetrating uh, uh, penetrating fixation devices, vascular injuries, and also literally the overconfidence and over reliance of navigation in a very mobile and yet to be uh, yet to be fully understood region of the uh, of, of uh, the crani cranial and cervical spine. The there are new developments uh, which involves navigation, and I always say. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't take away the need for fastidious alignment checks, uh, making sure that the chin brow angle, the horizontal gaze is preserved, and also the position of the patient so you don't put them in coronal imbalance, um, which has been a, a huge deal going back to, to, there's no good way to do an osteotomy to check um, to correct coronal imbalance that from a prior uh, prior surgery, and some of these um, some of what I'm going to talk about will involve the uh, preoperative alignment. Sort of, if you find a patient that has uh, basal invagination, how do we prevent uh, not just uh, bad positioning but also fixate, fixating them, which could uh, lead to issues like airway management. Okay, so. The other issue also has to do with translating a deformity down downstream with uh, uh, poor alignment uh, of the area of, uh, of interest, um, and, and this could cause uh, subaxial load, loss of subaxial lordosis, um, and also the patients are struggle to to maintain the uh, cone of equilibrium. So some of the uncommon, uncommon complications that I've seen literally involve the loss of sudden loss of airway um, after occipital cervical uh, uh, fu fusion or stabilization for a patient who had a um, ligament, uh, ligament disease early axanalus um, postoperatively with the increase in the angle uh, of a chin brow. They had to go back surgery to to restore her. Uh, um, alignment uh, because of uh, poor uh, respiratory uh, function, and, and this has to do with compromise of her airway. There are other issues also involve translating, if you skip levels, translating the, uh, uh, the, spinal, uh, the spinal column and causing uh, compression, uh, which could lead to significant uh, disasters, post-op, uh, spinal cord injury, et cetera. So, Another thing has to do with technical issues, understanding and also getting tactile feedback. So these days I'm always nervous in an, in an area of uh, significant um, real estate to say, okay, well now we're using navigation and power tools. Uh, at what point do we get any tactile feedback to know whether we're in spinal cord uh, vessels, um, et cetera, or even uh, nerve roots? And, and I always implore people to, to uh, pick one uh, from the beginning and ma achieve mastery before we uh, throw it all in because they're not they're not inf uh, infallible to failure. The uh, vascular considerations that I'm always concerned about is identifying uh, benign lesions that run on. Uh, sorry, identifying benign uh, 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 or should I say benign variations in anatomy. Um, a lot of uh, my uh, residents these days are not taking into consideration we're going to do an occiput to um, you know, cervical thoracic, et cetera, fusion. But I, I also want them to be able to see, have you look at the sagittal scans of the MRI? Do you know uh, this patient has no lesion per se, but do they have a, a benign uh, variance uh, or, or course of vessels? So it's always good to put all together before you get too caught up in, in your uh, planning. And this is a old, uh, Plating system where the uh, we're able to put these uh, plates laterally. Um, you always have a, a lot of tools in in the toolbox of spine fixation, but my concern has to do with: Are you sticking to principles? Are you going through the occipital keel versus putting in significant uh, individual plates for occipital cervical fusion, ending up in the uh, transverse sinus? So 
be careful of creative occipital plating systems. Um, uh, there's plenty, but not a whole lot of them were designed with uh, people who knew what the uh, transverse uh, sinus was. Um, the uh, the uh, last thing I want to talk about too is a case for joint surgery. So you have a huge, there's a, a uh, middle-aged lady with a large chordoma, uh, C2 uh, involving all the way to the uh, uh, retropharyngeal space um, and a posterior mucosa. This involved a large uh, group of people, both uh, highly technical ear, nose, and throat surgeons to perform a labio uh, mandibular glossotomy. We call the predator maneuver where you have to split both the, uh, the tongue, chin, and also the um, uh, the, the the whole jaw um, with uh, resection of the tumor. I don't think this is showing very well, but resection of the tumor and also subsequently anterior plating. That's when I come in around 3 a.m. in the morning when everybody's gone home uh, to put the plating in. But thankfully, we, we finished just in time for them to come back at at 6 a.m. fully refreshed after a good night's sleep to to close her up. And then posteriorly, we have to augment uh, this uh, fixation device. Advancement in technology has made this possible. Okay, so this this would have been partial resection, proton beam stabilization, but you, you can have um, significant improvement in quality of life um, with advancement in technology and also skill. But collaboration is certainly important. Unfortunately, she developed a uh, CSF uh, leak erosion through. Um, her hardware, which required a nasoceptive flap. Um, I had a uh, long conversation with the uh, infectious disease doctors, like, this implant is not coming out, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have to do it. I know it's infective, but it's, it can't come out, or there's, no, there's no way. So we had to treat through this, and, and subsequently she did well. So some of the things I always caution is the avoidance of reliance of 3D. There isn't a good place to fixate um, your, uh, shall we say, your reference frame. You know, you could, you could talk about the Mayfield, the head translates when you do that, you could, and you're too far away to put in shan screws in the pelvic region. So I always tell people, be very aware when you're using 3D navigation, you always have to use it the way um, people use flora with multiple checks all the time. And you also have to note your vascular abnormalities, anomalies also. And, um, negative persistence, you know, things are not going well, you need to take a step back. It may be that you're not going to be able to get that um, C1 lateral mass screw today. You know, you have to think about, okay, what else can I do? Um, do I need to think about also a C2 translaminar screw? Negative persistence in this area could really cause um, significant problems. Um, team discussion, uh, we, we've heard a doctor uh, Johnson mentioned uh, the blood pressure neuromonitoring goals and also uh, the instrumentation availability. How many of you have started cases and then right in the middle of it, you're like, uh, we just want to let you know that we don't have this screw size. We, today we didn't get this, we didn't bring this, or it was used last night and we didn't flash it. So I always try to have a huddle before we start while the patient's going to sleep to say, what don't we have? And is it available now or is it being uh, uh, cleaned or getting ready? So all those things tend to matter. But these days with technology, with navigation, it's becoming easy to put in the hardware. Um, but things that you cannot escape is where your vessels lie and also doing a proper job with alignment so you don't have a residual unsatisfied patient or even worse, a patient who's been maimed. So we, the, um, the changes in alignment may produce a downstream effect that could have significant uh, uh, consequence to the patient. And I always stress that because it's so easy now um, to place in the hardware with the appropriate uh, navigation. Um, but also, postoperatively, do check your scans. Um, compare it to the recent uh, uh, post, compare your most recent to your immediately post-op to see if there's been any change, and also consider adjacent level disease. Thank you.